At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, new customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On February 1st, 1968, legendary coach Vince Lombardi announced in a press conference that he was stepping down as coach of the Packers to concentrate on his duties as a general manager. Why do this less than three weeks after winning Super Bowl II and being the only head coach to be able to say that you won a Super Bowl up to that point? Well... Maybe it had something to do with a guy that would be born later this year. He knew that he would have to start gearing up a team for what that task would take and deal with for 20 years into the future. That name is simply Barry, Barry, Barry. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott! This time to stuff the DeLorean. That date is July 27th, 1999. This is a day that will live in infamy for a young Detroit Lions fan from Michigan. This was the day that Barry Sanders shocked the world, and announced his retirement. Nobody could say with a straight face that Barry would not have crushed Walter Payton's career rushing record if he would have stayed healthy, and that he would also be number one right now, with Emmett Smith still being at number two. But back to this day, July 27th, 1999, and perhaps the reason why in the intro I said that Vince Lombardi had to step down to focus on his general management duties, because... Barry Sanders was born in 1968. But in 1999, when Barry decided to retire, now I'm telling you what, you're talking about a 14-year-old kid that grew up almost literally never seeing another running back start a game for his beloved Detroit Lions. I think he might have missed maybe five games in one of the seasons or something like that, but he still hit that 1,000-yard mark every season. It was devastating. It didn't feel real. It didn't seem like the next season was right because I wasn't going to be able to watch my guy, Barry Sanders, number 20, toting that rock for Honolulu Bill and Silver jerseys and then just handing it to the ref when he crosses pay dirt. Which brings me a little bit into this week's interview because I had that same disbelief probably about a year earlier. Maybe it was even two years. I don't remember which year it was for training camp. But it was a summer day, Saginaw Valley State University. We were there for another training camp day where the Lions were going to have a morning and an afternoon practice. And you better believe it. I brought my cards, my footballs. I'm going to get all this stuff photographed by the players when they're walking through. I got so many of them when I was there. To this point, though, I never got that white whale. Never got Barry Sanders' autograph. Then, after the morning practice... Barry Sanders is doing his thing. You know, he doesn't stop for every single person because obviously every kid, every person wants Barry Sanders autograph. So he'd be there for like 52 hours. But he's driving, he's walking through, stopping, I don't know, maybe every 10th person or something. Somehow I get my football to him. He signs it and he hands it back. So I have this, I'm holding a football that touched the hands of greatness of Barry Sanders. Of course, I'm floating on cloud nine, right? We got these cool little things that you're doing afterwards, like in between. They got these inflatable. You can try to <laughs> catch this punt that's about a mile and a half up in the sky. All these other things that are there. And then we have 
afternoon practice. Right here, it's an improbable feat because I'm telling you, I promise you, in the same day, I got Barry Sanders' autograph twice. I went to the other side. He's walking. Happened to stop over where I'm at. Give him my card. Boom. In the same day, two most cherished autographs were obtained. And that's the feeling that this week's guest got to have on many occasions, even at his place of employment. Who's this week's guest, you ask? Well, it is Jeremy Swick, and he goes by The Average Historian. I'll let him get into that and why he calls himself The Average Historian in a little bit. But first, do me a solid. If you like this show, and you like the Sports History Network, and you have not signed up for the newsletter yet to keep up to date with what we got going on, and oftentimes we have those giveaways, you know, speaking of that, when the time this episode releases, we got a giveaway going on for a home field apparel vintage college t-shirt. I mean, this thing is primo premium. Pick your favorite college, they're going to shoot it right over to you. Well, that is if you win, of course. But what you got to do, I mean, for that, you head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. But what I'm talking about is the newsletter. You head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash newsletter. And as soon as you sign up, well, shoot fire. You're going to get all sorts of cool things about the updates when we get new podcasts on the network, when you get some giveaways and even what we got content coming out. So head over there. But if you already got it, I'll tell you what, forward it on to your buddy, somebody else that you know, guaranteed, will enjoy listening to Sports History Network Podcast. And with that, well, let's not make you wait any longer, right? Let's get into this interview with the average historian, Jeremy Swick. I should call it jump in with both feet into the deep end, and I gotta ask a question that's been burning in my mind. Why do you call yourself the average historian? Hey, that's a great question. I think one of the reasons, you know, I started this about 2018, even before I was, you know, out of gra- just just out of graduate school. But one of the things I realized is to a lot of people, I didn't look like your more typical historian. I think people have that kind of vision or envision of what they see a historian being. Someone, you know, locked up in their ivory tower, studying in the library nine hours a day, never seeing the light of day. Um, But it was one of those things that I really just love, always have loved talking about history. And at the same time, I've always felt kind of like your average person, just doing my day to day, but also still having that love for history. And I think at times, you know, being either ignorant or bold enough to continue uh, to follow my interests and my passions. I can totally relate to that ignorant part of it. And uh, I think everybody here at the Sports History Network can relate to the whole, you know, I kind of feel like a person that's just a normal, average type of dude. But at the same time, I have this passion for whatever particular sport they have or even multiple sports. What about for you? Let's go back in time. I mean, we could do this thing here. You can, I don't know if you could see this DeLorean in the screen or not. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I can. All right, so what you get to do is you're going to hop on this DeLorean. We're going to go back to when Jeremy was younger and a time when you just remember, I don't know, something that speaks to you that when you were younger and you're like, man, I really kind of like dig on this whole, not just watching sports, but like the history of sports. Like, do you remember a specific moment that you could recall? Yeah, there's there's a few. Um, One of those things is kids, you know, a lot of times, especially, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, there was a, those summer reading programs. And being in the Milwaukee area that if you read X amount of books, you got two free bucks tickets. And you have to remember this was before the 21 net world champion Milwaukee Bucks. So I don't think they could give those tickets away if they tried at the time. But as a kid, it's still something exciting. And my parents are super involved in the sense of making sure I read and not just filled out the form and turned it in, but I actually read the books. And one of the freedoms was I could pick whatever book I wanted. And nine times out of 10, it was a sports biography on everyone, you know, from Babe Ruth to Leroy Butler's book to uh, you name it. I probably read about it as, as a kid, but I think that's unconsciously where my love for sports and history uh, first kind of started to manifest. But I also remember they had those sports illustrated for kids with all the stat books or excuse me, all the stats and just little blurbs about each one. And I remember Michael Vick was on the cover of the one I remember reading and just, 
I remember soaking all that up like a sponge. You have to remember this was kind of early, not not pre-internet by any means, but early internet where it wasn't at, you can't ask Siri where what what's that happened. You had to maybe look it up a little more. And so I think that's really what got me interested in the sports side. Um, as far as museums, uh, growing up, we went to the Milwaukee Public Museum quite a bit. And I always loved seeing the exhibits. Uh, I originally was born in Guatemala. And one of the things they have at the Milwaukee Public Museum is a an exhibit on Guatemala. And I remember seeing that as a kid. And it was kind of the first time I saw myself, if you will, in history. And that's one of those moments that I was really... Uh, jumped out to me. How long did you live in Guatemala before you moved to the States then? So I was adopted. And so it was pretty quick, you know, not more than about six months. So I don't remember it at all. Um, But it was all something, you know, growing up that I was obviously aware of. And um, as a kid, it was something different, different. And, you know, that always made me Excited to learn more. I think even learn more about that history as well. Yeah, that's something that I that just struck me to think of. You know, like what have you been able to learn about? This is veering off football history topic, I guess. But Guatemalan history and culture that you know maybe you you really struck a chord with you that you think maybe throughout time has really kind of stuck with you. Yeah, it's one of the things. So I, I'm just one of the biggest things is I'm fortunate to be here. So, unfortunately, Guatemala had a 36-year civil war from 1960 to about 1996. I was born in 91, and to just learn more about that, learn without going, you know, too deep into it, uh, but learning about the U.S. US relationship, if you will, in in that uh, entire affair was one of those it made me think about going back to grad school when I was in grad school. Uh, some of the papers I worked on was really getting deep into um, looking at even some of those CIA documents that were in about 2003 declassified. And you learn even more about the history of one of the reasons I'm here, which, uh, you know, is a blessing. Of course, it's great to be here. But um, as the historian in me always wants to learn and know more. That's something that we can kind of transcend through, let's just say, in sports where, sure, we take sports for granted. And a lot of, you know, like, like the the fact it's just a game, right? It's it's just a game, but it really means so much more. And you can really be grateful for, like you said, where, where you came from and where you the opportunity you've been able to have. Um, speaking of opportunity and being grateful, we we kind of talked about this in the the pre pre interview here about you being a Packers fan and I'm a Lions fan. Everybody on the show or listens that knows that I'm a Lions fan. You mentioned Leroy Butler was one of the biographies. Was that so? Was the Lambo leap in that biography, or were you or did you read it before that occurred? So that was in the biography. It was one of the books he wrote. Uh, you know, talking about the struggles and I don't know if you watched the his Hall of Fame speech. Um, leading up to that, just kind of all the trials and tribulations he went through, you know, spending time in a wheelchair because his feet were so pigeon toed to becoming a pro football hall of famer. It's just, his story was always remarkable and he's just such a down to earth guy still lives in Racine, Wisconsin. And I think he's at pick and save almost all the time, either, you know, signing autographs or, uh, selling his vodka out there. So it's uh he's just one of those stories that always stuck out and to see him finally get that that nod to the Pro Football Hall of Fame was something that was uh really special being being a, a fan from Wisconsin. Yeah, it's kinda cool too. It's almost like you can that moment of the Lambo Leap can can mean more than just that particular play that was made and like you said, going through all the trials and tribulations, it's just you were able to see so much throughout your short little career as is and you know with the hall of fames and everything i mean let's dive into what were your roles at the pro football hall of fame yes so again being a kid from wisconsin this was a a dream come true this was 2016 i was actually intern there uh for brett Favre's indu- induction and as being a kid from Wisconsin, it, I don't think there was any, you know, achievement higher. I think at this point, the rest of my professional career was kind of just that extra, you know, that dessert on the side after being able to be part of uh, Favre's induction. But I was an, a registrar intern with uh, 
one of my now close friends, Dakota Harkins, always got to give her a shout out. Um, we worked in the archives together and a lot of it was processing new donations that would come in on a near weekly basis to just organizing artifacts they already had there and also helping with the Black College of Baha Hall of Fame's initial exhibit and just getting that ready to go. And then, of course, it was all hands on deck for the Pro Football Hall of Fame enshrinement. So you, when you say donations, you're talking about like artifacts that would have been donated to the for, for various like maybe families and things like that. Yes. So everything it was from families to the teams to the you know former players or former coaches. Um, I remember. I mean, you you. It was one of those things. I always feel like when you think of Pawn Stars, when you never know what's <laughs> going to walk in the door, and that's how museums in my career have always been because you really have no you have really have no idea what's going to come through. And I remember during that time period, we got Johnny Menzel's jersey from one of the games from the previous week. Um, a lot of stuff from JJ Watt, which was pretty cool when he was on the Texans. But it was really just, and of course, with the incoming induction, that's one of the big things we get in the summers is stuff from each player and each coach. And I learned from that experience, a great thing to do is play the egos off just a little bit with each other, because sometimes guys aren't always ready or willing or interested in responding right away. You send them, start sending them pictures of, okay, this guy's going to be next to your locker and there's nothing in yours. Uh, the next thing you know, we got Marvin Harrison's high school track cleats where he won like four state championships. And, and it, it's always just fun to see what those guys really have, you know, hiding in their, in their man caves at home, if you will. You kind of, you, you alluded to it earlier, like a surreal lifetime moment where so what artifact from Brett Favre's induction were you able to like hold in your hand um his bust the bust from the ones that they put on display we one of the jobs was cleaning those and making making sure those were ready to go but i mean really just putting all, all the pieces of his his historic career into his exhibit locker was just one of those really like you said surreal experiences uh, just, uh, although he went to that team in the North, uh, towards the end of his career, he spent the majority of his time, uh, in Wisconsin with, with the Packers. And so it was just, again, one of those real fun experiences. Right. Yeah. You mentioned the team in the North and it, it's like a blip on the radar, especially this time in the Jets. I always forget about that too. I mean, there's other reasons why you can't forget about it, but it's like far Packers that's just what it is like I would have been the same thing if I would have been able to be there for Barry Sanders and you know put you know touch the cleats that maybe or it wouldn't have been cleats back then I guess because it was turf but touch the turf shoes that he wore when he made that I forgot his name but the Dallas Cowboy guy like spin around and go what what way did he go you know that kind of deal (laughs) yeah but it's okay uh, okay let's play a game All right, ready for the game? We'll play a DeLorean game now. So you get to go back in time on right. this DeLorean. You stole the either you stole the keys, I gave them to you, whatever you want. But you're gonna go back in time and let's pick one of those artifacts that you received or you were able to process, you're able to organize whatever it is. But not like a recent artifact, like something from way back in the day, little late 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever it is that you could go to that moment of when that artifact was either worn on a game or whatever it was, and you could actually be there and be present for it, which artifact you go into the game? Uh, that, that's an easy one for me. It's not pro so much. Ooh, that, it's tough. I have a pro one and a college one. I'll say my college one first because it came to the top of my head. It's Red Grange's jersey from 1925. Easily that go actually, back to you that. Obtained it, you, you obtained it during your so, time or just you were able to organize it? We, we already had it, uh, and it was it, we ended up we move objects every once in a while, and that was one of those that we ended up receiving, or that we ended up moving, I should say, from, our, from its uh, you know standard standard position. But I got to take it out of the glass is really what it came down to. But if I would say, now that I know what you're saying, is an artifact that we received, that's it's it's more recent but uh, i was you know steve agner's jersey 
that that was definitely up there um, from both college and pro. And the when I was there, I mean, there's there's so many that it's just not not ones jumping uh, out to the top top of my head right now. Um, I guess okay. So it was the 1873 program from the fourth oldest known game. It was uh, Columbia versus Yale. And to have that in my hands, a program, you know, football was four years old at that point. And to be able to touch it and open it up. And one of my favorite pieces of that was that instead of like position or, you know, normal stats that we might look up at when we see a guidebook, um, instead it was the schools they were in. So it was like school of law, school of ed. And just to see how truly it was such an amateur game uh, during that time period. That would be really cool. I mean, I, I get, I'm, I'm like closing my eyes and I'm imagining watching like those old, I don't know, like when they excavate a, a tomb of a mummy or they go into some archeological dig and like you wearing gloves and all these things to like, to not like put your oils on this paper. Is that how that works? Oh yeah. You're making sure you're taking every precaution you can with uh, some, something of that age. It's just, you know, how fragile it really is. Um, one of the interesting things is I don't usually wear a ton of gloves when I'm handling paper that, that old. And that's really because you're always, you always get nervous with the fibers on the gloves that you don't want to accidentally rip anything. So a lot of times there's me washing my hands before I touch it and obviously drying them. And so you can feel the texture of the, the actual paper. Instead of wearing the white gloves, even though that's a lot of times when we go do interviews or give tours, you pull out the white glove treatment for something like that. A little bit more of a show than it was for handling those day-to-day, at least with paper, a lot of the times, which is something, you know, a little little interesting. Yeah, but it would be so cool to just to sit there and hold something that you're like, this is 150 years old. And there was whoever back then could have been, or like even the Red Grange, you know, uniform. And it's just how, how, how cool when you transport yourself. Are you that person? Like when you watch documentaries, you like find yourself transported back to time. Oh yeah. I can, I feel like I can envision it. I feel like I'm there. Um, and that's one of the things I've always loved about history is for me, I remember even like as an undergrad, a lot of those bigger lecture hall classes, you're basically taking a Scantron test of multiple choice answers on, you know, whatever history subject you're in. But for me, I've always looked at history as a big story. So those scantrons were always super easy. The multiple choice were super easy because I'd look at it and, you know, this, this could have happened before this because this happened in that order. And it makes me think of a story. I was in my freshman year, a hundred level history class, a big lecture hall. We, uh, we take, we take the exam or whatever, and we're getting our, our, papers back and uh, my professor ends up you know calling everyone uh, calling everyone out saying we overall did really well someone though got a hundred percent on this exam and so it threw off the curve and i let's say it was probably a friday morning so you know maybe went out a little bit had some fun on thursday night so i'm like what 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 kind of guy what what kind of dork uh you know who studied for that i mean i, I looked at it for a little bit and you know I thought I did pretty well. I know I didn't do terrible. And of course, singled out me in the middle of class. Uh, I was the one who got the 100% of the exam because, again, I just read it like a story. So I remember, okay, well, that that, that was impossible. That couldn't have happened because such and such, you know, didn't exist yet or that war hadn't happened. And I, you know, breezed through the exam. And, you know, that's just to go say, like, I've always envisioned history as a, a giant story. If you could, I mean, again, not just sports related, but say you could take a DeLorean back in time and sit, your safety is no concern. Like you wouldn't be hurt, you know, I'm not saying you're pervious, you might feel the struggles, but like what period of time would you want to go to if you could live for like, say a week or a month? My biggest curiosity would be probably ancient Egypt. And I'm thinking like old kingdom when the pyramids were built. And for me, it's just understanding how mankind at that period in time was able to make structures that looked like that, that, you know, they were considered ancient even by the ancient Egyptians in some cases of how old they were. 
I think that's one of those areas of history that really has always uh, captivated and uh, interest me. And I'm sure you saw my logo. And that's one of the reasons why I had pyramids, because it's, it's nothing I really studied in depth, but it was always, I think it always is that testament to history. And, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those visuals, if you will, of of history. Have you ever been able to go to other countries or other places like that for these types of like super old, more than like just a couple hundred years ago type of thing? So I had the opportunity in about 2014 to head off to Italy for about a week uh, to visit one of my really close friends who had just got out of the military, but also to explore Rome and Venice and kind of get that experience. And the Colosseum was, again, one of those experiences that was just incredible. I knew I was boring my friends because, of course, I'm someone who wants to read every single sign that 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 exists in a museum. So I've, I've learned sometimes it's best for me to go by myself. But uh, that was definitely one of those, uh, you know, surreal experiences. And uh, traveling more is definitely up there on my list uh, to see some of those areas of history that maybe I'm not as well versed in, but would love to learn more. Yeah, that when when people ask me what are the one of the places you want to go, like Rome is one of the top for like the different architecture. I want to see the Colosseum, I want to see all, and go like Greece, the Pantheon, all that type of stuff. And so, okay, you were there. You can actually tell me. Obviously, modern day we have these stadiums that far surpass it. But like, what kind of size are we talking about this Colosseum when you were there? It it was almost you know incomprehensible not only just by its size, but what went on between the gladiatorial battles, but also they would have like hunting expeditions. And so you you look underneath, uh, you know, where the main stage would have been laid flat. uh, There there's chambers for not only gladiators, but for, you know, live animals, the amount of skulls they found different animals, everything from lions to, you know, elephants to, you know, really been a little bit of everything because people forget how much Rome had conquered uh, kind of during their heyday. So they were really just bringing, you know, animals from from their kingdom, if you will, from their empire. And I think it was to see that how much that traveled and just even the ancient depictions of some of the animals you're like, you look at and you're like, oh, that's that's definitely, you know, a lion, which is, you know, you're in the middle of Italy and it kind of doesn't... uh it doesn't resonate or it doesn't make, it doesn't, I guess, I don't envision lions walking around Italy, if you will. <laughs> yeah, they're not just sitting there on the streets <laughs> like that. But yeah, no, that, that whole era has always it fascinated me. Uh, one of the guys on the network, so Oz Davis, he runs a show. Well, I, he hasn't released one in a while, but called Truly the Goats. And his episode two or three or something like that, it was, uh, I'm going to butcher it, but I think it was Flama the Great, which is considered possibly one of the greatest, maybe the greatest uh, gladiator of all time. He had he was able to like win his freedom many times over, but he kept going back into it. Yeah, right here, Flama the, Ga- the Gladiator, episode number three that he put out there. And it was very interesting listening to that and the different, the like you said, the different things that were there besides just like what we think of a typical gladiator battle and you know, have you ever listened to Hardcore History, for instance, by Dan Carlin? Yes, yes, I have. Okay, well, two things. First of all, I had him on the show for episode 100 because he was one of my inspirations for starting a history podcast. And that dude love that. knows way more about the history of football than I would have ever anticipated. I thought I was going to talk to him about the correlations of maybe some of the military terms and football and what how football could have been. Uh, affected in 19 you know the 1940s from the wars and we got into the weeds of like the nuances of how the game and the offensive line interacts to you know like all these very cool episode if you like dan carlin i recommend going back and listening to him but secondary yeah he had an episode too about like the the gladiator days and the 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 arena but it was more from a a torture perspective unfortunately but you know how you know how his shows are so (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. you know he's he definitely <laughs> hands down one of the greatest storytellers of my generation at least since from a podcast perspective and independent and everything and there i go again getting off the football topic but it's a wildly interesting uh vast topic hey history is history for sure i mean everything ties in and it's like that's what's cool about like going back to football history and like 
the different ways that people interacted and uh, like I had this one guy on uh, uh, Ken, Ken McGee. He was he's talking about because he has like a book for the U of M. Uh, like literally every Michigan program and ticket stub, he has a photo of it that just released, which by the way, fortunately, listener of the show, when this releases, you're not going to be able to sign up for the giveaway, but there is a giveaway going on right now that ends Saturday night, August 20th. So go ahead and get that, sign up for that book. But yeah, he talks about like how all the programs would have like different, uh, like the culture of the time and the programs you would see it in there, like during World War II, of course, you see soldiers and things like that. Just, just very interesting how they interconnect and such. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I still remember at the couch hall looking through those 43, 44, and 45 programs. Um, it felt like I was at, you know, July 4th parade getting one of those programs. Um, really, really, especially, you know, in the Army Navy programs, it's literally them going to war against each other. And so it's one of those really interesting, I think, errors of of football, especially with the you know the military teams, um, and the course and the pros, the teams combining because they don't have enough guys because everyone's off, you know, fighting. Yeah, it's actually a perfect segue to real be back in because the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was like your time with the College Football Hall of Fame and like what was your role there and some of the tasks that you would have. Yeah, so I was the historian and curator uh, there at the Hall of Fame for about four years. And when you ask me what my tax was, it was a, a little bit of everything from, of course, getting the new donations in, but also working with the team to design new exhibits, um, work on the histories from everything from social media posts to doing blogs to doing interviews with a wide array of uh you know, different organizations and really just uh, helping to be that kind of front facing person of the Hall of Fame, the the historian, if you will. And it was, was, you know, such a great experience getting to kind of do a little bit of everything from getting artifacts in to then taking them and doing what we always did was a kind of a what's new in the archives. And it, it served a dual purpose, not only for us to make sure we processed everything in kind of a timely manner, but also so we could send to pretend or to donors saying, Hey, look what we put on display. And so we'd let it run for a few weeks and it kind of gives that thank you to those people who took the time to reach out, to donate, uh, to, you know, share their history, sometimes their family history uh, uh, with us. And I think one of the things, I mean, remember I got a, a scrapbook from Jay Burwanger's family. Of course, the Heisman Trophy winner, Jay Burwanger. I never envisioned I would be scrolling through and seeing baby pictures of Jay Burwanger. And, you know, it, it was a really beautifully done scrapbook um, by the family. And the person who donated was in the family and just didn't really have that same kind of sentimental value towards it. And But at the same time, wanted to make sure it went to a good home. So I would say one of my main purposes at the hall was really just telling those stories and sharing them in a in a way that was, of course, relevant. Uh, so sometimes it was skipping over the the in the weeds at times, you know. But not always the easiest thing when you're a historian. You you want to write a, a short little blog and it ends up being four pages, and you know you're about to cut three pages out. So it was always doing that that balance. But I think with social media, it helps because you can only put so many characters in a post, and so. Uh, you know, sharing that, looking at just ways that the Hall Corps could share share their stories, uh, of course, celebrate the incoming Hall of Famers, which at any major Hall of Fame, or I should say any Hall of Fame, that's kind of the, the big event of the year is uh, getting out and getting donations or loans from from those various guys. Yeah, so you, you kind of touched briefly on it. I mean you, you tell the story of course and and that's what the 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 person that's it's at the on the like the listener the fan the the viewer the person that's coming to see these different kinds of um what are they called displays but like what about the back like behind the scenes like what's the archive process like for say both hall of fames cataloging everything I mean going from di- paper to digital like how that's got to be a huge task Yes, um, it, it is a huge task, um, and of course, I want to give give the, the the props to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um, it's just one of the most 
immense archives. I've been in for sports hall of fames. Of course, they've been around quite a while and the way everything was meticulously detailed and organized, I uh, was one of those things that really, I, I always tell people at, you know, the, the, the other museums I end up working at throughout my career is that's always something I've kind of held to a gold standard. I want it. I, I want my next, I want that museum to, be in the same realm or be in the same breath as how organized and put together they are. And that was one of those exciting and a little bit daunting challenges at the Kyle Triple Hall of Fame was uh, taking the rich amount of history we had and, you know, making, making sense of some of it, uh, making sure it was organized in a way that we could easily find things, but also, um, you know, having the best museum and archival practices as well. And so um, one of those, it feels like a kid in the candy shop because when I'm designing exhibits, a lot of times it was on our little table, if you will, um, and just kind of thinking about what, what would look cool, really, really what it comes down to. You know, a lot of times we did, uh, we had about three by three foot by three foot uh, mobile exhibit cases and of course had the glass on the top. Um, and those were really, we could change them. I pretty much changed them whenever I felt like it or, you know, something major in college football happens. A lot of the fun things would be when that last year, when Penn State and Illinois went into that multiple overtime game, I'm, I'm sitting there on t a TV at my friend's house. We're watching this going to overtime. I email both of the uh, sport sports uh, equipment managers at the schools I was like, hey, I don't, I hope whoever, I think I said, I hope Illinois wins. I hope Penn State wins, depending on who I sent the email to. Um, but I would love some stuff. For, we, the Hall of Fame would love some stuff from that game. And of course, they sent one of the game balls, uh, program, uh, the gloves by the the receiver who, you know, ended up winning the game. Um, and so that that's always, that was always really fun with college football and the Pro Hall as well, as things happen in the moment you're almost reaching out to the schools while, while, while it's still going on and getting, making sure it's that fresh relevant content. Yeah. It's like instant history and it's like, you're making sure that you get it and everything. I didn't, didn't even think about it from that perspective of, Hey, whoa, whoa, just make sure you get that stuff and don't, don't let it go to the, you know, go to the curb. I mean, not that they go to the curb, but don't lose it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, exactly. And so, it was one of those things because sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, does like the, the great Tom Brady heist, does that, does that like cringe in your bones then as an archivist? Like, I can't believe somebody would do this. I wish I could say, I can't believe, I totally can believe, but oh yes. Uh, so some of the ways, um, even people display their stuff, you know, especially with the pros and even with college, a lot of the game you stuff becomes, you know, ends up on the market. Um, if you will. And a lot of times I'm in those groups telling people, Hey, you should probably display it like this, or I see a really bad glare on that. Is that, you know, is that UV glass? And, you know, some of them are like, Oh no, it's not. I'm like, Oh, well either get a UV case or, uh, they have really nice strips now for your windows that kind of block out the UV. But I, I've realized any museum kind of anywhere I go that, uh, the museum brain doesn't, uh, doesn't leave you. But it's always one of those things that I love seeing in private collections. But I think it's the historian and curator in me that would love to see it for the public. Do you ever think about doing that as a side gig, just maybe for pro athletes that are retired or somebody else? Like, hey, I'll help you create this like beautiful, uh, whatever, uh, what do you call it, exhibit for your collection? I've I've helped a couple people uh, in just talking with them. Just hey, you have a lot of stuff. Oh, you think about looking at like this, this, and this. Um, I'll send you some pictures of some of the some of my houses I've lived in, and uh, it looks like a it looks like a museum person lives there. I'll put it that way. Um, but it, it's always fun because you. I just kind of I think you envision that because that's kind of what your training is, uh, and so making it look aesthetically pleasing and it definitely. My my studio in Atlanta looked like a little little mini exhibit. Yeah, I could imagine you have a different lens that you look through when you are looking at different kinds of exhibits. Just like you said earlier, your brain never turns off. And let's go let's go deep down a little personal then. So 
what's your your most ch- like i i know it's like your kids they're all the same right you love them all but like give me one most cherished or one that you'd have to take out of a burn and build in artifact that you personally own that you that you that you like the most uh well believe it or not there's a ton um <laughs> i i would say oh that's that's a tough one um, I would say I actually I have a, a if we're talking more autograph type stuff, you know, I have a, a helmet signed by Star Farvin Rogers, which is one of probably one of my favorite pieces. I think that would probably be it. Just thinking off the top of my head, I'm looking around the house and I'm like, there's a million things, and I think most of it would just have okay, to. Okay, let me. I'm rephrasing. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna rephrase a question because this is this is going to be a different this a different version of it. Because you just okay. you said autograph. I didn't even think about autograph. Okay, so what is your most cherished possession of an autograph, but not because of necessarily the autograph, but you were the one that received the autograph, so you got to meet the individual? Oh, Coach K. I have a, a floorboard signed by uh, Mike Krzyzewski. And as a kid, me and my dad took the Amtrak down to Chicago because one of his new books came out. And I was a big reader. And of course, the rules were supposed to be he's only signing the new books. And me as a kid, you know, I brought all the books he had because I read them all. And I had the little piece of Cameron floorboard. And it was one of those I was like really hopeful to get signed. But, you know, never, never knew. You never know because those things. And I remember I put the books down and he was signing all the books. And I remember he said something like, oh, this one looks real. Looks like it's been read a few times. And I went to hand him the the little the plaque or whatever, and his PR person like kind of grabbed it from me. And was like he doesn't he's not signing those, and he got so upset he didn't like yell or anything, but he's like, let me take it, and then has makes the person grab a chair, and pulls it up next to him, and I get to sit with him for like twenty five minutes, twenty minutes maybe, and just talk, while he's signing autographs. And so for me personally, that was, that, that's probably been the coolest, uh, you know, experience. I know it's not football related, but it's, uh, it's definitely up there. No, I mean, you're, you're talking about an experience that every time you look at that autograph, you just remember that he took the time to say, no, this kid is going to dang the rules. He's going to sit with me now and I'm going to give him the special treatment because like he took the time and effort to come here. And like, that's what is cool like these guys that just don't sign autographs at all or they like are very i don't know rude about it it just kind of bothers me because i understand you got a job you got a thing to do but it's like this kid's coming up all they want to do is just an autograph i mean you're their hero in that moment in that time and uh let's give some speaking of giving love to people right there let's give some love to your current role as the archivist at wisconsin black historical society what is this uh what is the mission of the society and what are your what, what do you do there so, yes, I, absolutely. I appreciate that. Uh, one of the greatest things is we've been around since about 1987 and, so, you know, documenting and preserving the history of African-Americans in not only Milwaukee, but in the entire state of Wisconsin. Uh, really sharing those stories that maybe are a little bit unheard, unheard of or not known by as many people. And one of my jobs there is to really, you know, with with the other archivist is to make sense of the mass amount of data from memorabilia, from programs, from, you know, important events that happened in the Milwaukee community and the Wisconsin community as a whole. And again, making, making sense of it and making, making it presentable and preserved for future generations uh, to come. And so it's, it's one of those things that's been a, it's been a challenge, but it's been an exciting challenge from looking, you know, going through books to see, how many we have of one book and seeing what what's worth uh, hanging on to um, and looking at the collections of some of the really well-known people or uh, important people of the African-American community in Milwaukee. And it's some of those things that it, the, the artifacts are different from, you know, past experience that I I've had, but uh, in a lot of, in most respects, even more meaningful uh, just because what they mean to uh, to the community, and so it's been one of those really, uh, you know, exciting new new t- new frontiers, if you will, 
uh, of my experiences. So if the listener of the show wants to learn more about the Wisconsin Black Historical Society, where would they go? Yes, you can find us at the WBHSM.org. Let me say that again, WBHSM.org. And then we'll try to leave a link in the show notes for him as well. And before I move on to the next uh, couple things I got for you, so have I been saying archivist wrong? You said archivist or something like that. Or is that just a Midwest, like past the Midwest border thing? No, no, I think I think both would be more more than acceptable. Okay, well, you know, either which way. I mean, I've uh, we talked about this before, but like one of my reviews that I got bad and was this guy said this dude doesn't know how to pronounce anything. I forgot. I think it was uh, it was Massillon, but I spelled it, I said it like Massillon or something like that, and that was like a bad review. I'm like, oh come <laughs> on, man, leave me alone. I, I had to laugh really because I think I, that, I think I. <laughs> I think I did read was that, that you? review because I was like, oh, it looks like it was, it was not me. But I had to laugh because I saw it was like 4.9 and there was one review and it was, I was like, this guy, you know, I had to, I had to laugh a little bit because, you know, I, one yeah. thing I've learned about being, you know, on TV and interviews and, you know, every, everyone has an opinion on, on what you're doing, uh, doing right or wrong. So, so I was just ignoring, but I, did take I a, tried to ignore both sides I, of it. <laughs> I, I I didn't really necessarily ignore it though. Together, what I did was I was like, you know what, you're right. If I'm gonna really, because these were my solo episodes, it's different if you're interviewing and something comes up on the spot. But it was like back when I was soloing, and I'm like, you know, this person's right. Why didn't I not take the care and time to just at least try to go pronounce it? You know, at, at least look it up. It, it, granted, every city has different like way. Like ones that's perfect is you know, Worcester, Worcester, and all like, it's like, how did you get Worcester out of that? Well, I don't make any sense, but you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I did take it to heart and uh, <laughs> it's just, but I didn't take it to heart. Like, Oh man, I'm going to find this dude. Like in that, that Jane Silent Bob movie. And here's my list. You know, you laugh and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, any, so anyway, okay. So what about you yourself? Where can the listener of the show find your work in particular beyond just some of the things we talked about? Yeah, absolutely. So on almost all the social channels, I'm uh, the average historian um, on Instagram, Facebook, all, all that good stuff. And then Twitter, it's the it's, Twitter. It's real J Swick uh, because there wasn't enough characters for the average historian. But I love sharing, you know, history, not only just college football or, you know, pro football or African-American history, but a lot of times it's anything I, I find interesting. Um, I like to share. And speaking of that, so let's close it out with last words of wisdom through the lens of the average historian. I think one of the biggest things for me, and I think we talked about this a little bit already, is really chasing and sharing your passions. Um, The good thing I've learned is the money, because obviously if we could work for free, I think we'd all have jobs or we'd all have maybe different jobs. But I think one of the things is the money will find it if if it's meant to be. And so all these, you know, ups and downs of, you know, moving four states and about seven cities uh, for different opportunities, of course, was, you know, a little bit of stress at times. But it was one of those things that just kind of finding ways to stay the course and, uh, you know, just being exciting of, you know, being excited of what you do, uh, even if maybe it's not your nine to five, but what you do outside outside of work um, as kind of enjoyment as well. And I, I wanted to mention one thing because I brought them um, some of my favorite cards. I wanted to bring that up because it's uh, again, combining those passions of loving sports, loving history, uh, being a kid who collected sports cards uh, growing up and now being a big kid, uh, you kind of are able to get a, a little different, uh, different cards, but I wanted to show this one. Let's see if we can get it. So it's a 1949 Kenny Washington card. Oh, wow. And so he, as you, as you know, was one of the first, the one of the first African Americans uh, post uh, world war two to sign a pro contract. And, Again, it's kind of combining those interests. Uh, one of the areas I studied in graduate school is African-American history. 
So naturally, a lot of the cards I ended up collecting are related to, you know, prominent African Americans uh, who broke down barriers, whether in their sport or, you know, obviously in society as well. And I have one more card I'll show you. It is a 1910 Jack Johnson. Let's see if we can get, hang on one sec. It's a 1910 Jack Johnson boxing card. He was the first African-American heavyweight champ. And so, again, let's see if you, let's see if I can get this. Did you say 1910? 1910. So it's about 112 years old right now. Wow. And so, again, like I said, it's just sharing, you know, that rich history. And, uh, of course, I'm sure you've seen in the sports sports world, uh, sports, sports cards kind of boom during the pandemic. And it was one of those things where a lot of friends that I knew started collecting or got back into collecting. And I think I've always just been a big kid kind of collecting the entire time. So it's been it's been fun to see that kind of revitalization of sports cards. Uh, kind of hit the mainstream once again. Boom. There you go. Now talk about a cool perspective from behind the scenes, you know, through the lens of a person who's actually worked as a curator for multiple sports hall of fames. I mean, he talked about all these very old documents, being able to open them up and read them. These people, these things, Red Grange's outfit or uh, uniform, being able to touch that uniform that he had, just all sorts of cool things that I guess the average guy, hence, don't know why he calls himself the average historian. He's no average guy, right? He's somebody who's been able to be part of many Hall of Fames throughout his career. Now, myself, I've only been to a couple of them. More recently, I've been to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2018 and 2019. The only time I was actually there for the induction ceremonies, which, if you have never been, I recommend going for the weekend so you can not just you know go through the hall, see the bus room, all that stuff, but then be able to watch the ceremony speeches in person because it's a different experience than just watching my TV. But the coolest thing that I had, and something that you can also listen to, is when I was there, I have multiple, I guess you can call them on-the-street interviews, where I ask people at the Hall of Fame to give me you know, their favorite football moments of all time. And of course, they're normally going to talk about probably either a player that was inducted at that time, or you know, at least from a team that was being inducted, because that's the reason why they're at the Hall of Fame that, that time. But I'll tell you what, I can't recall how many times when they were talking about their favorite moments of all time, you got the tears in their eyes. Just light up, even just recalling it, thinking about it. Maybe it was they went to a game with their father who's no longer around or the grandpa or somebody like that. I mean, this one guy, I mean, he like literally stopped. Like he couldn't he couldn't talk anymore. He's like had to like he couldn't breathe basically, just crying because he was talking about the Joe name of the football that he got autographed as a little boy and it burned down in a house. And as soon as that part happened, he was just blown away. Which was pretty cool, though, because the New York Jets organization able to get in touch with them, and they sent him another autographed football. So that, that was pretty cool, too. Which you can see over on the website. We have Howie up there. But that's what it's all about. We love this game, and we love to honor it, and remember the people that helped build it. So if you want to keep their memory alive, or, or even for not just football, but like any sport, team, player, whatever it is, We'd love to have you over here on the Sports History Network contributing with either writing articles or, hey, perhaps maybe starting your own podcast. No matter what you're interested in, you can hit us up over at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contact. But for now, dude, I am through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. Put up my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand. And that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices, doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect. Ah, oh, that's a nice one. College football, 1923, Navy versus Penn State. 
Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson. But both offenses took some time to get going, a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. Wilson certainly was great On the that. next kickoff, who would end up as returner but Harry Wilson? Wilson dodged at least a half dozen Recall the greatest moments in sports history or just your own personal favorites with Row 1 Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. When the gun started to mark the Olympic cast, will remain Penn State 14 Navy 0. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.